So, time now to take you through the papers. Here with us to review them are the broadcaster Afua Hagen and the journalist Thomas Copeland. So, very good morning to both of you. Nice to see you so bright and early on a Saturday morning. Um, and uh, let's turn to the papers then. And almost all the front pages dominated by this very shocking attack on Sir Salman Rushdie. Uh, Thomas, you've picked out uh, the Daily Mail's coverage of this and their headline. Uh, focuses on how many times he was stabbed. At first we didn't know exactly what had happened to him, but they're suggesting up to 15 times he was stabbed. That's right, this is a story that's dominating nearly all of the papers. Rushdie was due to speak at the Chautauqua Institute in western New York, just sort of south of Buffalo, when a man ran up onto stage just before uh, Rushdie was due to be introduced, and uh, we're told that he punched him, stabbed him, and there was some really horrifying images going around social media, actually, of blood on Rushdie's chair and on, on the staging just behind him. Eyewitnesses said at the time he, was, he seemed to be well enough to walk off the stage, but then very quickly afterwards was put on a stretcher and taken away uh, by a, a helicopter to a hospital in Pennsylvania and just late last night then there was an update from uh, Rushdie's agent that said that Rushdie was on a ventilator he was unable to speak he was likely he would lose an eye the nerves had <coughs> severed in his arm and uh, that his liver had been severely damaged as well um, so the context for all of this I suppose is really important on what makes this story so uh, so, so shocking uh, Rushdie sh shot to fame with his first book, um, uh, which won the Booker Prize, and then his fourth book, Satanic um, Verses, in, in 1988, um, uh, was received a huge amount of uh, discussion and uh, was, was found blasphemous in the Muslim world. And then Ayatollah, uh, in the Supreme Leader of, of Iran, issued a fatwa, a death decree in 1989. And that forced Salman Rushdie into hiding for nearly 10 years and was sort of the beginning of, of a lot of the kind of uh, was a significant element in the progress of that of that radicalization of, of, of the violent element of, of, of Islam that, that has emerged ever so slightly in the years in between. In more recent years, um, Rushdie's found a home in New York. He was knighted in 2007, found a home in New York and seemed to be much more out and about. Um, uh, but clearly, uh, what the, the Iranian state broadcasters as of tonight have been saying that this is some high evidence or this is evidence that um, the, uh, the, the, the edict, that the fatwa still holds value and is still, um, is still relevant today. They have distanced themselves from it in the years in between. But the motivations for this attack are still unknown. A 24-year-old man from New Jersey has been arrested. And of course, New Jersey is about six or seven hours away from uh, the, the location uh, of the attack, which begs the question, of course, how did an attacker walk straight in to the literary festival where this was taking place? CNN has some reports of disagreements about whether security recommendations were ignored in previous years. The leadership of the Institute saying, no, we had states and we had sheriff representation there. Um, I mean, tragic news that has been, that has been met with uh, reaction from around the world, Boris Johnson, Macron, um, Chuck Schumer, as well as from the literary world, J.K. Rowling, uh, Stephen yeah. King, and so many more. Well, yes, exactly. And, and, and Thomas, as you, as you rightly say, questions obviously over security and Afro, we, we don't, as, as uh, Thomas was saying, know uh, about any motive, even though an arrest has been made at the moment. But one of, one of the ironies of this, if you like, was that Salman Rushdie was about to, to make a speech about freedom of speech. And a lot of people have talked about this being an attack on freedom of expression. Oh, absolutely. And a lot of um, authors who have reacted to this saying that this feels like an attack on freedom of speech, feels like an attack on the right to be able to write or talk about anything that you want. But it is actually worth noting that the FAFWA was actually never rescinded. And although, you know, wasn't um, the Ayatollah Khomeini didn't still encourage people to act on it, it was never rescinded. And there are still people who hold long memories who still perhaps think that the satanic verses, you know, Salman Rushdie's fourth book is still as offensive then and still offensive now. Now, like I said there is no motive we don't have any knowledge of a motive yet you know this attacker is young 24 years old he was born after the time the satanic verses was even printed and um, so we don't know but what we do know is that lone attackers lone wolves who work in this way feel more dangerous than a kind of group effort because these people seem to come out of the clear blue sky as they have done 
in this instance. And you know, you're, you're absolutely correct talking about security concerns. The fact that this person was able to almost walk right up on stage. You know, people, eyewitnesses saying that they thought that perhaps he was fixing Salman Rushdie's microphone or doing something technical. And then they saw yeah. the knife and it took people in the audience to be able to overpower him. So it seems that there has been some real, real lack of security in this case. And although Salman Rushdie was not living under the FAFSA so much anymore, he wasn't in hiding as he was for nearly 10 years under a false name, you know, jumping in and out of Jaguars with security, going underground into restaurants and hotels. He felt that he could live more freely. This just proves that actually, once you are living under that shadow of a fatwa or shadow of death threat, it doesn't actually go away. And although he yeah. felt he could live more freely, clearly, clearly, there are still huge security concerns around him. Indeed, and everyone wishes him well. Uh, we, we await uh, the latest update um, and we'll bring it to our viewers, of course, uh, as soon as we do. Ephra, I want to move on because I know you wanted to talk about the front page of The Eye as well. And they focus on the drought conditions that many of us are, are living with in this country, um, with the heat wave continuing as well. And they're talking about the implications uh, for farmers. So what are they saying? Absolutely. So like you said, the drought continues. And the headline here is that the drought will shrink the UK's food crops. Now, this is going to come as another blow of bad news as we go into the autumn winter. And yes, we have a, a drought now, as you can see here from those pictures, quite dramatic of how dry um, the country is seems and is at the moment, but if that goes into the autumn and winter, if they could be dry as well, then we could be seeing uh, lower yields when it comes to vegetables, they could be smaller because they don't have as much water to grow them, um, and crop could be essentially failing for farmers up and down the country, and that could then push food prices up as well. Uh, we could see a fall in the crops of maize and potatoes, so it seems that, you know, as well as having rising inflation as well as food prices going up for other reasons, the drought is going to impact that as well, which means that as we go into the autumn and winter, the UK is living in a time of food insecurity. Essentially, that's what this is. If we were going to be talking about another continent perhaps, or a country in the global south, we would be using the word food insecurity, and that is exactly what is happening here. So as well as the drought having um, an effect on the postpipe bans, on how much water we use, or whether we can have barbecues, it yeah. is going to mean that we're heading into food insecurity as we go into autumn and winter. That can okay. mean inflated prices, and also us not being able to get the food that we usually have. And very quickly, Thomas, I guess questions for the future as well. If we're going to get more hot summers like this because of a changing climate, questions over whether or not crops are likely to change in this country, whether we're going to be growing different kinds of, of fruit and vegetables. Well, this is one of these classic problems because, uh, and it's a, a, a classic policy problem because what will happen here is that, um, you know, we are facing much hotter summers in this country and, and the evidence of that is fairly demonstrable and that will have an impact on the crops and, and that will have then a knock-on impact on society in all the ways that I've always lined up there. The problem, of course, is that, you know, come about September or October, this problem will totally disappear and suddenly it'll, di it'll, it'll totally disappear from, um, uh, you know, from, from public policy concerns and it won't be a prior priority and we'll be here this time next year saying oh we should really have done something about the fact that actually we can no longer grow crops in the same way that we have done yeah. for the better part of any number of years in this country and then it'll come around the cycle again so it's one of these policy problems that requires and it's difficult to do because it, it is it, it is sort of a seasonal issue like that but our summers are getting hotter and if we want to have food into the winter then we're going to have to do something about it. Yeah I know it's, a, it's, it's such a big topic isn't it that everyone's got to grapple with. In the meantime, the immediate issue of the uh, Tory leadership contest uh, continues and uh, the Daily Telegraph um, features uh, the fact that uh, the first cabinet minister to switch sides between these remaining candidates um, has come forward. Thomas. That's right. That's right. I think, uh, you know, the results of this contest are starting to look a bit like a fait accompli in favour of Liz Truss. Rishi Sunak's backers are starting to realise that now as well. You Is said that right? I mean, when, when yeah. I'm talking to some of his supporters, they say, oh no, the polls say one thing, but when we talk to people, we talk to members, it's very different. But do you, do you think that they're coming round to, to, to agree with the polls? Well, well. 
you know, I, I think they would say that in any case. Um, I, I, listen, I mean, well, how close it will be, I don't know. From the beginning of this contest, the, the challenge for Richie Sunak was always going to be trying to close that gap in the polls. I don't think most people have seen significant evidence to suggest that he's been making enough movement, enough momentum, that he'll be able to crawl mm-hmm. that line by September the 5th or, you know, the, 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 the date that all these results are published. And actually, most Conservative Party uh, members will have voted before that. Uh, people like Robert Buckland, he's not the first Tory MP to defect, but he's the first cabinet minister, uh, is evidence, I think, of the fact that very senior people who have got far in politics, and they've gone far in politics because they recognise where their base is and where it's going to be, mm. are starting to realise, or at least starting to admit publicly that you know Liz Truss is going to win this. Quite what um, you know Robert Buckland maybe expects he will get in return for his tenacity and yeah. defecting in quite so public a way, I don't know. Um, a really interesting question will be what happens with Rishi Sunak if, and yeah. maybe I'll say when, he loses this contest. Okay. Um, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to whiz this on if that's all right. We'll probably return to politics when you, in, in other sessions, but I did want to get the front page of the Star in. We haven't got very long after uh, 30 seconds. Uh, the headline is Nice Beavers. I think that's a verdict on the Beavers. I think they're doing a good job. Tell us why, very briefly. Yes, they are. So they've been reintroduced to some national trust sites. And in fact, because of the way the beavers build their dams, they've been able to direct water uh, and create wetlands in their national trust site um, that usually would, well, or would have been very, very dry at this time of year because of the drought that we're in. So it seems that the, um, the National Beaver Association are saying that if we introduce okay. beavers more back into the countryside, we must leave it there. For us and Afri- for beautifully described, but we're out of time. Afro and Thomas, thanks both very much indeed. Top stories coming.